Hi, and welcome to Virtual Bible Study with Father Brad Matthias. This is week 21 of our extended series of online studies. I'm now the rector at St. Margaret of Scotland Anglican Church, and if you're a regular attender or a part of our parish, you were able to enjoy that beautiful service on Sunday as we honored and said goodbye to 11 years faithful servant, Father Jeffrey Monroe, and his beautiful wife, Linda, as they have uh, recently stepped down and are now serving with the bishop at the diocesan level. Uh, Father Monroe is now canon to the ordinary and is serving our bishop, Brian Marsh, on a regular basis, as well as the diocese as a priest at large, if you will, filling in to help uh, other parishes that need uh, a little support. So his expertise and his experience are going to be put to good use. And he has spent the last 18 months training and preparing and mentoring me uh, through the process of stepping into uh, leadership at St. Margaret's. And so I want to publicly thank him for his faithfulness and for his excellence in the work that he does. And uh, if you're a friend of his or you know him and you haven't had a chance to thank him, I would encourage you to do the same. Uh, and his links are available on our Facebook page uh, with St. Margaret. So, with that disclaimer, uh, we love you, Father Jeff and Linda, and uh, we wish you the best, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. So, for this week, it is uh, Trinity Week 9. We just read these epistles in the Gospel, and I want to reread one of the epistles uh, that we used on Sunday. And I want to encourage you to get your Bible and uh, or a iPad or a smartphone and look up this passage, follow along with me. And if you've got a journal or a notebook uh, to just write down something that may really stick out to you, something that you feel like you're supposed to really hold on to, that would be a great benefit, I believe, to you spiritually. The epistle this week is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it is the first 13 verses, and I'm going to uh, read them in parts so that we don't lose your attention. So I'm going to read about five verses at a time, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, starting in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized in the Moses in the cloud, and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with nevertheless with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, just as context, this is the the letter to Corinth. It's the first epistle that we have in the scriptures of the letter to Corinth. And it may not have been the first letter Paul wrote to them, but it's certainly the first one that we have in the New Testament. And it outlines, uh, just really, we're ten chapters into a, a pretty lengthy letter that Paul wrote to the church. you got to understand where Corinth was and understand the context that it represents to us today in our modern era. Corinth was one of the larger cities in the world at this time. It was one of the more prosperous cities in Asia Minor, and it was connected to Rome, and it was connected to the Eastern sort of civilizations of the world. And it was very cosmopolitan. It would have been a very hot sort of happening place. There were a tremendous amount of wealth and commerce and entertainment and excitement. It would have been bustling, and it would have been hundreds of thousands of people in one area, so the diversity there would have been extraordinary as compared to maybe other places or regions in the ancient world. And so Paul is writing to a very cosmopolitan, very diverse church, and he is sort of laying out for them some of the concerns he has as a bishop or a apostle in the early era. And if you've read through Corinthians, you realize that he's sort of systematically going through these different issues that the church had sort of fallen into, to, you know, just 
struggles where the, the culture or the secular values had invaded the church and had distorted some of the purity or the original values that Christ had laid out for his people. And so Paul is writing this letter as an encouragement, but also as a warning. He is saying to the church of Corinth, be careful. There are some things that are happening within the church that should not be happening. And he is also aware that the, the church members are a mixture of Hebrews who have converted to Christianity, Greeks who have converted to Christianity, Romans who converted to Christianity, and then a, a smattering of other sort of influences and cultures as well. And so he's trying to draw them to a point of commonality, a place where they can all share in the identity of Christ and share in the identity as God's people and help them understand that that identity supersedes or is greater than their individual identities that they brought to the church. And so he is helping them sort of unravel the knots that had formed in some of the relationships. There was some contention. There had been some rivalry going on within the church. There had been sort of these early divisions between groups of people. Some who wanted to follow one teacher, like Apollos, and another one wanted to follow the apostle Peter, and some of them wanted to follow Paul. So they had sort of developed factions and were already sort of sparring between themselves as to who would be best. And so Paul is writing to the church and he's saying to them, look, I want you to understand the, the commonality of your struggle. I want you to understand that what you're going through in your faith journey is not different than what the ancient Hebrews went through a thousand years or more before what was happening in Corinth. Now for us, the ancient Hebrews would be 3,000 years ago, but for Paul and his contemporaries, it would have been between 700 and 1,000 years before. And so he is pointing to the past, and he is saying to them, look at the example, look at the illustration of the history of the Jewish or Hebrew people as they left slavery in Egypt and then transferred from Egypt over to Canaan through the exodus, through the wilderness journey, something that should have taken no more than a few weeks, ended up taking 40 years. And so there's this powerful illustration. If you want to read about that, it's contained in the Old Testament books of Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where you have these sort of descriptive details of the different challenges that the people of Israel faced in the wilderness and how they did or did not respond well to them and it is a really sort of sobering reminder. And so Paul is saying in these first five verses of 1 Corinthians 10, he's saying to them, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers. I want you to understand that the shared heritage of faith that we have in Christ with those Hebrew brothers, that foreshadowing that occurred 700, 1,000 years before Christ's appearance is a commonality, but it is not something that you should take for granted and it is not something that should give you a false sense of security. In other words, the Hebrew people were so entrenched, many of them, in the traditions of their fathers that they took their identity from their fathers, Abraham and Moses primarily, and they took comfort in knowing that because they were of the lineage or the ancestry of those men, that they were somehow immune to the uh, risk or the temptations of life, that they had a sort of get, get out of jail free card, if you will, spiritually, because they had this Hebrew lineage. And they, they had a false confidence then in their ability to navigate life and the challenges of the spiritual journey of life, and that they should not approach life casually or indifferently, or with a false sense of security. And so that gives you the context for the next verses, and I'm going to read them now, and hopefully we can connect, connect that dot. So in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul continues by saying, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, 
The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, he's saying, guys, I know that you have this incredible lineage and many of you have this sort of connection with the ancient Hebrew world and we can trace our spiritual heritage back to Moses and we can trace our spiritual journeys back to these forefathers that had journeyed from Egypt to Canaan, and they went through this similar pattern of behavior. And he's saying to them, what was a risk for the, the children of Israel in the desert 700 years before is a risk for the Corinthians in their day. And I'm saying to us that the risk that's, that was valid for the ancient Hebrews and the Corinthians is still valid in our time. In fact, it may be more valid today than it's ever been. And so by using the parallels then of scripture and looking at the patterns of the wilderness exodus, the patterns that occurred in Corinth, and then seeing the patterns that are happening in our current secular culture of America or the Western world, I can say with, without hesitation that these patterns still exist and that these warnings that Paul has made should be taken just as seriously today as they were when they were first written in the first century. So, Paul specifically names different types of temptations or issues that came up within the children of Israel that were a risk for their destruction. And he warns them with specifics. And he gives the examples back and forth. There's almost a poetry to it. He's saying, they did this and God did this. And they did this and God did this. And every time they Fought, fell or succumbed to these temptations, God judged them. There was a severity to the response that should not be ignored or dismissed because the actions that they took were dangerous to their not only physical well being but their spiritual destiny. And so Paul then finishes his warning in verse 12 by saying, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So Paul's warning to the church at Corinth is sort of echoing through history and time to us today. And as you read these passages, they should sort of make you uncomfortable a little bit. There should be a little bit of a warning sense to this, an ominous uh, attitude or posture of Paul's text. And I, and I think it's important for us to pull back and say, all right, if we're going to study scripture, if we're going to live as Christians in this culture, if we are going to be faithful servants of Christ, then we need to take the Apostle Paul at his word. And we need to respect what he's saying at a level that will change how we approach our day, how we live tomorrow, how we make decisions, and how we look at our life. And so I took the time just to break down a few of these temptations that, as, he, as I'm quoting Paul, that are common to man. And the temptations are interesting. They're not necessarily what would come to the first of your mind, although some of them may. So if you'll take five minutes with me, I'm going to go through these, these four or five different categories of temptation that Paul pulls out of the history of the ancient Hebrews and says, be especially careful with these different patterns of sin because they are normal for the man or woman without God. In other words, without Christ in your life, these are dangerous things that could trip you up. But then he goes on to say that these were, were believers. These were people that were in in the nation of Israel. And so symbolically then, 
These are people who go to church. These are people who are active or around the church and religion and know sort of the truths of scripture. But he's saying to them, that's not enough. You're going to have to be vigilant to protect yourself from falling into the same traps that these people fell into 3,000 years ago and that the Corinthians were at risk of tripping over uh, in their time. And so here they are. The first common temptation is idolatry. Now, idolatry is an unusual term. We don't use it in our culture very much, but at the time that Paul wrote this, it was very common because the world was very full of idols. Idols would have been other deities or other entities that people worshipped than Yahweh or Jesus. These would have been stone images. They could have been wooden images. They could have been uh, natural elements like the sun, the moon, the stars. It could have been the ocean. It could have been the wind. It could have been fire. It could have been any of these things that man was in awe of. And so he erected a deity to as a form of worship in hopes to invoke the blessing then of that entity or that deity or that force that they didn't fully understand. And so when Christ comes into the scene, he sort of erases the need for all of these idols because he is the revealed son of God. He is the revealed evidence of the true God of gods. That is the point that the Christian world sort of made into this time of the first century. So Christians were reviled and eventually persecuted because they wouldn't worship the other gods. And there were some major deities in Corinth. There were some major pagan goddesses in Corinth that people worshipped, that people from all over the world did pilgrimages to just to be there. And so you've got to understand that Paul is speaking about idolatry in the sense that everyone would have known what he's saying. But in our culture and in our time, it's more subtle than a huge stone edifice that people put flowers at and candles and, and meat and food and fruit around and said, I'm worshiping this deity and that's my goddess. This is more subtle for us today. Idolatry is anything in our life that we elevate higher than Jesus Christ. Anything in our life that we worship above and beyond the one true God as revealed in Christ Jesus. So for us, that could be someone that we admire or idolize, someone that we follow, someone that we respect so much that whatever they say goes. And their opinions and their beliefs are greater than ours. And so we just do what they say. That would be an idol, right? That would be something in our life that's elevated above Scripture, above the truth of the church, things above Christ. Another idol can be money or success, this idea that we must have these things and we must make a certain amount of money and we must live in a certain kind of home and drive a certain kind of car and have a certain kind of jewelry. You know, there, there is a drivenness in our culture where we sort of worship success and people who make the most money are worshipped the most. And if you don't believe me, just look at, you know, a TV or look at social media. The people who have the most followers aren't necessarily the most uh, highest integrity or have great character or even that have wisdom. They're people who've made the most money and so they are admired and idolized. They're movie stars and fashion designers and influencers from, from the online world. And so the, that kind of idolatry where we elevate something or someone or a accomplishment higher than God is a risk then that can cause trouble for the Christian today. And they all involve a substitute or surrogate where we are replacing what is true with something that is false. And so Paul is warning Corinth. He's saying, guys, don't do what the pagans are doing. Don't fall into that trap. Don't allow yourself to be deceived into thinking that this could make you happy or this could satisfy the deepest longing of your heart. Only Christ can do that. And so he's warning them, if you do that, bad things are going to happen to you as followers of Christ. You're not going to experience the blessing and the favor of God. In fact, you're going to experience judgment. You're going to experience God's wrath. Be careful. This is serious business. All right, I've made my point. Second thing is indulgence. Paul says that they were indulgent, and he uses that term with sexuality and sexual immorality. 
So these are big words again that were common in the Greek. I want you to think about it in our time and in our context. Indulgence is simply the unrestrained, active desire of a person. You are indulgent when you have an entire box of chocolate at one time. You are simply enjoying dessert if you have one or two, right? So indulgence in itself isn't necessarily evil. It's the giving yourself over and the unrestrainedness of your desire. In other words, it's going way overboard. It's indulging yourself in something that otherwise in small quantities or in the appropriate context is healthy and good. And in sexuality is the very first thing that he mentions here. And it was what happened to the ancient Hebrews and their journey in the wilderness. It's what was happening in the church in Corinth, and it's what's happening in our world today. Sexuality is designed by God. There's nothing wrong with sex. There's nothing evil or dirty or inappropriate about sexual fulfillment. But it is meant to be appreciated, enjoyed, and shared within a covenantal relationship of marriage and so when you indulge in sexuality it means that you're just letting yourself do whatever you feel whenever you feel it there's no restraint of any kind and so that sort of animal instinct kicks in and sexuality then becomes perverted distorted and destructive it becomes addictive and it becomes a snare then to the soul and it destroys people even those who've follow Christ. And so Paul is warning us, look back, look at the danger that this caused within the camp of the children of Israel. And look at how God severely judged it as he really, really responded. He killed 23,000 people because of their sexual sins. And so he's warning us that that commonality that we have with our older cousins, if you will, back in the desert, is still alive in the human spirit. And so it needs to be monitored, checked. It needs to be contained by our vigilance. In other words, don't allow yourself to just fall into this stuff. Be aware that it's a real possibility that you and I could fall into the sin of indulgent sexual gratification if we're not careful. No one rises above this. No one is immune to the touch of these temptations. The third temptation, then, is putting Christ to the test. Now, this is challenging because what this really, this is my interpretation, is that when you put Christ to the test, what you're doing is you're putting conditions on him. And you're saying in your heart, if God does this for me, then I will respond by giving him what I know he's asked of me. And so that conditional relationship with God, you know, you're, you're saying to God, look, I'm not sure I trust you. I'm not sure you're trustworthy. I'm not sure that I'm willing to sacrifice what I want for your will unless you give me one more thing or unless you fix this problem in my life or unless you heal me of this condition that I'm battling. And so putting Christ to the test is a natural temptation. It's natural for us to get frustrated when we don't get what we've prayed for. And it's natural for us to get confused and frustrated and and even full of despair when things don't go well in our life. But putting Christ to the test is that next step where you challenge him, and if he doesn't do what you want, then you're going to pull out. You're not going to stick with him. And that is a dangerous temptation, and God does not respond well to that. That is not something you want to do with God. And it... You know, for us as Christians in the modern era, it also means that we have to discount and completely ignore the evidence of God's faithfulness and love as demonstrated by dying for us on the cross. A a horrific and painful death that he did not deserve, that he has already proven to us his goodness. There's no reason for us to go back and put him to the test again. There's no reason for us to question God's goodness after seeing Calvary, after understanding what he did and why he did it at the cross. And so I want to remind us that even though when terrible things happen to us, it is natural to question God, what's going on? 
It is not appropriate for us to take the next step and then in anger put him to the test. And the children of Israel did that in the, in the ancient Hebrew histories. They did it in Corinth, and we are at risk of doing it today. And so we should be aware that is not cool, not something we want to do with God. And the fourth thing, the fourth temptation that's common to man is grumbling. Yes, this idea that, you know, I don't believe the good things are ever going to happen to me, and I don't remember anything good ever happening. All I can see is the bad. All I can feel is terrible. And so my entire life is sort of fixated on me and my victimization and all the terrible things that have happened in my life. And so what's happening with grumbling is we choose deliberately to ignore and forget the good things in our life, the blessings that we've received. And we focus and fixate on the negatives only. And so as people, as humans, it's natural for us to get discouraged and down and start to really wonder if good things will ever happen to us again. But the grumbling part is when we go to God and say, I wish I had it the way it used to be. I want to go back to my life before you. I want to get away from you because everything that's happened to me since I've met you is terrible. That grumbling spirit, that critical spirit, not only is against God, but then it poisons those around us. And it is a sin. It is not appropriate. And so Paul would later write in the book of Hebrews that the, the root of bitterness then poisons those around us. And we are to stay away from people who have given themselves over to grumbling, who have given themselves over to bitterness. And so these four temptations as described in 1 Corinthians 10 represent to us critical areas of our life to be vigilant, to be aware, to guard ourselves against, and to not ever think that we've got this covered. Because the ultimate meaning of this entire passage uh, of the epistle from Paul is to remind us that we are as much at risk today as they were then. That we never escape the influence of the culture around us and the evil that is in our world. But God has promised in this passage through Paul's words that he will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to handle. That means then that we have an escape in Christ. We have the ability to, when faced with these four terrible temptations, to turn from them, say, no, I'm not going to give in to that, or I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to move back to my position in Christ, and I'm going to cleave to him, which is an old English term that means wrap your arms around him and hold him as tight as you can. I'm going to hold on to Christ, and I'm going to believe his promises, and I'm going to say no to these lies, and I'm going to say no to these desires, and I'm going to trust that God has a better way for me. Now, for the Christian, this is spiritual warfare. This is what we do as Christians on a regular basis. And Paul is just telling the church at Corinth, you got to fight this. You cannot allow this to happen. And you can't approach it from a defeated attitude that you'll never get through it. And you can't approach it from an arrogant attitude like you've already been through it. And you don't have to worry about that. These things continually come into our lives like the waves on the seashore. And we have to be aware and we don't need to be discouraged, and we don't need to be overwhelmed by them. We just need to be vigilant, aware that they're out there, and that those influences could really hurt us. I love the way Matthew Henry, an old uh, theologian, wrote, We cannot fall by temptation if we cleave fast to him, meaning Christ. Whether the world smiles or frowns, it is an enemy, but believers shall be strengthened to overcome it with all its terrors and enticements. The fear of the Lord put into their hearts will be the great means of safety. What a wonderful summary of that. Matthew Henry's commentary can be found on BibleHub.com. It's free and it's very helpful. What I think Matthew Henry is trying to say to us and what Paul is trying to, to convey in his letter to Corinth is this. We need a healthy fear of God if we are going to live and overcome the temptations of our world. There are just certain things in our life that are never going to go away. The thing that can change within us, though, is a reverence and a fear of God that reminds us of the severity of sin and the judgment that is assured if we continue in sin and do not 
follow after Christ wholeheartedly. I hope that was insightful. I don't know that it was fun, but it was certainly insightful for me as I sort of looked at those four things and I went, oh my gosh, I can see those four different things in my life all the time. And the temptations then to give in to them. And if you're like me, you need a community of faith around you to remind you of the truth. You need a regular diet of spiritual nourishment, being in the word of God, being in the presence of the saints to keep us healthy and whole as we navigate our lives. So if you're not a member of a church yet and you're in the Conway, New Hampshire area, we would sure love for you to visit us. We're found at 85 Pleasant Street in Conway, New Hampshire, 03818. You can also find us at stmargaretconway.org. Well, I love you guys, and I hope you're doing well. I look forward to seeing you here next week for virtual Bible study number 22 as we look at the text from Trinity Week 10.